Uh, we are on chapter 17, entitled The Skeptic's Wager, Pascal and the Reasonableness of Faith. First, I want to just mention a little bit about who this guy Pascal was. I'll have my coffee with me to keep me awake here. Pascal was actually, his dates are born 1623. He died in 1662. So that was about normal life expectancy in those days. In fact, probably a little bit longer. Um, he was clearly a very um, gifted fellow when it came to intellectual pursuits. He started out as a mathematician and he taught math and he was very good at it. He also became an inventor. Uh, in fact, he invented the first calculating machine. I remember when I, uh, my first year of community college down in Saratoga, this was 1973, fall of 73. And uh, of course, technology wasn't where it is now back then. It was just sort of getting started, right? So I went into the college store one day looking for some books, and I noticed that they had these fancy little calculators <laughs> that looked really, really like, man, how can you make a machine that can do any mathematical, you know, problem? But sure enough, this thing could do anything. So um, it was 25 bucks. Today, it would be worth about 50 cents, probably at the most. <laughs> That's true. <man>. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but I, I purchased it for $50. And that's how I got through. Uh, I had a math requirement, so I took statistics for dummies. And uh, that's how I got through statistics with my little calculator. Um, later on, he also uh, um, invented a way to streamline mass transit in big cities. So he, he had a kind of mind that could, could think uh, think about big issues big problems and how to how to how to solve uh you know um very practical sorts of things so um so he was able to streamline mass transit and he's also credited with being one of the person or persons who was the creator of modern written French prose, okay? So all of you probably are aware of the fact that Martin Luther virtually invented what is now called High German, the German that is the official German. Like every European country, there are a gazillion dialects, right? And uh, every morning, Kirsten listens to Norwegian podcasts so she can keep connected to her homeland. But sometimes someone will be on there from, she comes from Oslo, someone will be on there from Bergen or from up in Trondheim or, you know, way up in uh, above the Arctic Circle, or any other part of Norway. And they all speak different dialects. So, you know, she can't always understand exactly what they're saying. 
Um, uh, I don't know how, how familiar you guys are with the East Coast of the, of the U.S., but, you know, every city along the East Coast, it's not really different dialects, but it's different accents. You can tell somebody from Boston, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to park my car. <laughs> or you can you can tell somebody from Philadelphia. I you know Kirsten went to school there, so I heard that a lot. Uh, people in Maryland have their own accent. Uh, they don't call Baltimore Baltimore; they call it Balmer. And uh, uh, and New York City, of course, is is is. Uh, notorious for its accent so we have different accents here uh, but we can usually understand each other but my friend Eric had, had, a, had a Chinese gal who worked for him when he was still with my brother's company Abaxis and she uh, she sold these these uh, medical diagnostic machines in China and um, uh, when she was a kid, meaning a teenager, she came to the U.S. to go to school. Uh, she wanted to become a veterinarian. And um, according to her, this is not me saying this, so it's not, this is not a matter of prejudice, but according to her, the veterinary schools in China are not very good. So she decided to come over here. And she ended up in Arkansas, of all places. <laughs> a Chinese person in Arkansas. Oh. <laughs> and while she learned English, when she got to Arkansas, that accent was a little hard for her to figure out. You know, people in Arkansas have a Southern drawl. And, and so it was a little difficult for her to understand that. Um, but when it comes to the written language, okay, let, let's take, uh, so, so going back to Luther, when Luther was translating the, the New Testament, he translated on his own when he was in, in the Wartburg College being, or the Wartburg Castle being hidden by Frederick the Wise from being arrested. He was, he was being hidden up there and he translated the New Testament on his own. But when he translated the Old Testament, which is far more complicated, Hebrew is a very complicated language. You read it from right to left and the written form of Hebrew uh, leaves the vowels out. So you have to know what vowels belong, you know, in a particular word. So he's going to take this complicated language and translate it into the language of the people, right? So what he did was... He actually um, went out into villages, normal German villages where the common people lived, and he copied down the way that normal German people spoke. Mm -hmm. And that's how, that's, that's the, the German that he used to translate the Old Testament. And that, in turn, became the official written German language to this day. Okay, so uh, every, uh, every German speaks uh, the German of Martin Luther. Well, Pascal didn't have that much of an effect on French, but he, he did have an effect on, on, uh, on the written part of of the French language. So he was a man of many talents, okay? Um, in, in, uh, when he was in his 30s, 
he had a religious conversion. There was a revival going on in France at the time, uh, which, of course, as you might know, is Roman Catholic. And uh, he said he had an encounter with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not the God of the philosophers, but the God of the Bible. And at that point, he, t he started writing religious um, materials. Now, he wasn't a trained theologian, so he didn't write theological books, but he wrote things uh, that represented insights into the Christian faith. Okay, and one of the things that he did that has become famous is Pascal's Wager. Okay, now this is Pascal's Wager. His wager is this. You can either decide to have faith that what the Bible is saying is true in which case you're going to end up in heaven or you can decide it's all a bunch of bunk become an atheist and you and you're not going to end up in heaven okay so he said given the fact that we don't know in a scientific sense we don't know what life after death is like, or even if there is life after death. We, it, this is not something that can be proven. We believe it because we believe Jesus actually did ri rise from the dead, but we weren't there, right? And even Thomas, his disciple, demanded uh, evidence, right? When, when, when the disciples... Uh, were gathered, you know, because they were afraid in this room, and, and they they says to Thomas, "We saw the Lord." And, and uh, what did Thomas say to them? You remember? I won't believe it until I see the holes in his hands and in his side. Exactly. He wanted evidence, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Just like people in a court of law or anybody who makes a claim about something. You want evidence. Um, before the FDA would, would release this vaccine for emergency use, they wanted evidence. So uh, if you're talking about the Pfizer vaccine, and I think Moderna did the same thing, they did they did a study with so many people. It seemed to be about 95% um, effective. So on the basis of that evidence, they uh, issued an emergency use of the vaccine. Thank goodness for that. Um, so um, we don't have that kind of evidence for life after death. But according to Pascal, you're faced with making a choice. You can either believe that you are going to survive death in some form, or you can believe that when you die, that's it. You're done. It, you, you know, you're just eternally gone. All right? Now, what makes more sense? Does it make more sense to bet that we're going to live beyond death? Or does it make more sense that we're not going to live beyond death? Well, he says... It obviously makes more sense to bet on the idea that we're going to live beyond death 
um, according to the promises of God as they have been recorded in the Bible, because if that's true, then we end up in heaven. But, and, and moreover, if it's not true, what do you lose? Nothing. You don't lose a thing. You just end up dead like everybody else. Okay? So that's Pascal's wager. And 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 the reason uh, the reason D'Souza um, quotes that wager is because he wants to suggest that the idea that faith and reason are somehow opposed to each other, that you can either rely on reason to find the truth of things, or you can rely on faith to find the truth of things, uh, but you can't have it both ways. That idea, which came out of the Enlightenment, he says is false. Faith and reason actually walk hand in hand. And one enhances the other. All right. Now, last week, we talked a little bit about um, the difference between a closed universe and an open universe. A closed universe is a universe where only natural laws determine what happens. So if only natural laws determine what happens, right? So let's take an example. Um, if I get, uh, if I get liver cancer and I'm at stage four, uh, the likelihood of there being a natural way of me surviving that disease are almost nil, all right? Nevertheless, people of faith, what do people of faith do for people who are sick? What do we do? We pray, that's right, we pray for them. Why do we pray for them? We hope for a miracle. We hope, we hope that it, in some way, whether God uses natural means to do it or whether God intervenes directly, that God will hear our prayers, uh, God will decide to say yes to our prayers, and the person we're praying for will be healed. Now, if that's true, well, first of all, let's back up. If, if it's not true, if we live in a closed universe that only natural laws regulate, then praying is an irrational act mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, even if there is a God, God doesn't intervene. And, and by the way, that, that, that reminds me of something that I think is imp important for us to understand. Hold on a second. I'm totally addicted to this stuff. Um, during the Enlightenment, which was that period of time when people turn to reason as opposed to uh, what they considered to be just ancient mythology. Okay, we call it revelation. And I'll explain that in a second here. But... Um, Philosophers and intellectuals 
particularly in the 17th and the 18th centuries. Not so, uh, it, now this does not apply to, to, to the common people, okay? We, we're talking about intellectuals. We're talking about the people who live in ivory towers, okay? And write, write books and uh, dream up theories for a living. Um, these folks believed that we lived in a closed universe because, because of the success of science, particularly the success of the astronomers, Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler, all of those guys, you know, through their use of the telescope and uh, mathematical equations, they eventually figured out that we live in a heliocentric universe, that is the sun is at the center, and that the rotation of the planets around the sun is not a perfect circle. It's an, ellipt it's an elliptical circle. In other words, um, it's stretched out. It's not a perfect circle, okay? And the reason for that is that as the planet comes around the sun and is moving in a certain direction, it takes gravity some time to pull it back around to the other side. So it's an ellipse instead of a perfect circle. Okay, so, so they were able to figure all this out through observation, reason, and mathematics. And it seemed to many intellectuals at the time that this suggested that all of the natural world, not just the planets and the sun and the moon and the stars, that all of the natural world was regulated by natural laws. Okay, so thus we have the birth of science. And uh, the modern scientific method, which by the way was invented by a very pious Christian by the name of Roger Bacon from, uh, he was from England. He, he basically invented the scientific method of study, okay? Uh, very important person in the history of science. Okay, so, um, so, so while these intellectuals were doing all of this kind of, uh, you know, um, reasoning about natural law and what governs reality in the natural world, most of the common people, most of the common people didn't, I mean, most of them didn't even have an education not even an elementary education. I mean, it was Martin Luther. Here again is our friend Luther. Um, I bet you can't guess that I'm an admirer of Luther. Um, Luther advocated for public education for children. He was one of the first people to do that. And he kind of, he sort of scandalized people when he said, not just boys, but girls too. You educate both of them. You know, it, it didn't make sense to him to just educate the boys. Uh, the girls need to have uh, a basic education just as much as the boys do. Okay, so... But, but this hadn't, you know, even those who had a basic education uh, weren't familiar with what all these philosophers and scientists were doing. The common people were still going to church 
they were still admiring the relics of the saints. They were still going on pilgrimages. Uh, they were still saying the rosary if they were Roman Catholic. Uh, they were still doing all of the things that that um, um, Christians from all periods of times did, did. So, so we're not talking about you know the common everyday folk here. The local butcher wasn't worried about whether we live in a heliocentric universe or not. Um, and and by, by the way, this is another thing that's interesting, okay? You know what the common people, when they heard this theory that the earth goes around the sun, all right? Uh, in order to illustrate their objection to that, I'm gonna use an example. All right. How many of you have a dog? Anybody have a dog? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Jerry? Yeah. All Not right. anymore. Yeah. Um, when you have a dog and you put the dog in the car and you go for a ride, what does the dog like to do? Goes out the window. Yeah. He likes to stick his head out the window. Yeah. Because somehow dogs like the feel of the air, right? Okay? So the common everyday guy on the street, when he heard that the earth was moving, his response was, <laughs> well, why don't we feel the wind that, that we would feel if we were in a moving vehicle? I mean, if the earth is moving, you'd think we would feel the wind from the movement of the earth, right? Didn't make sense to them. So, so um, they, they, they were thinking in very practical, everyday kinds of ways. Um, so uh, anyway, the philosophers, they didn't abandon religion either. What they did was they invented a form of religion that conformed to their assumptions about natural law and reason. And that religion was called deism. How many of you have heard of deism? Yeah, yeah? okay. There's a uh, conservative commentator, I forget his name now, um, will, uh, will somebody, anyway, he claims, uh, he claims that all the founding fathers of this country, uh, George Washington, James Madison, uh, you know, uh, Jefferson, 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 um, you know, th there was a whole slew of lesser known guys, Patrick Henry, John Adams. Uh, he claims that they were all deists, okay? Mm -hmm. They believed in reason as the way, the royal road to truth, truth about the world. You use your head, you figure it out, you do scientific experiments, you observe the results, and then you can formulate the laws that will predict what will happen um, under similar circumstances. And then from, from, from there, uh, all kinds of different things uh, uh, begin to be... Um, advanced, mo modern medicine is advances, uh, you know, be, because uh, people are uh, dissecting human cadavers to see how the body is constructed and, and figuring out, you know, the, the circulatory system and the muscular skeletal system and all of this. All right. 
So, um, so uh, this guy, George Will, he's, he's the guy I'm thinking of. His name is George Will. Yeah. He thinks all the founding fathers were deists. Well, what a deist is, is a guy who believes that God created the universe just as it is to operate on its own. In other words, suppose I make cars, all right? When I'm done making my car, um, I'm done with the car. The car then is sold and it, you know, the, the owner operates the car and the car operates uh, because it is constructed to operate, you know, um, having used the engineering necessary to, 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 to build a vehicle that can do the things a car can do. All right. You, you don't, the people who, uh, the people who, who made the car do not intervene in the operation of the car unless, of course, the car breaks down, okay? Otherwise, the car just operates on its own. All right, so that's the way they understood the universe. Only they used the metaphor of a watch. You know, you, 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 you make a watch, a watch just runs on its own, you don't have to do anything with it. You put it on your arm, and if it's working properly, every time you look at it, it tells you what time it is because it's operating the way it's supposed to. Nobody intervene. God doesn't make the watch do what it does. The watch does what it does because it's made to do what it does. Using the principles that are discovered by science. All right. So they believed that um, God made the universe to just operate on its own. And then God sort of retired. He just took a hike. <laughs> he, he, I don't know, maybe he went to Tahiti or something. I don't, anyway, he was gone. He, he doesn't intervene in his creation. He doesn't, you know, if, you see, a scientist, here's what a scientist would argue uh, with, with, with us about regarding miracles. Uh, but by the way, there are scientists who are also pious Christians. I, I don't want to suggest at all that just because you're a scientist, you can't be a Christian. That's not true at all. Uh, like I said last week, the list of scientists who were Christians is much longer than the list of scientists who weren't. Anyway, what a scientist might have a problem with when it comes to, say, prayer, uh, or the idea that God intervenes in the world uh, to make things happen that wouldn't otherwise happen, the scientists would say, well, if that's true, then we could never predict what could happen in the future based on our discoveries. Because God could intervene at any time and change the outcome, right? So science, science as a discipline that enables us to predict what will happen given certain circumstances, um, you know, let, let's take a, a cancer treatment, for example. Um, Let's go back to the liver cancer uh, example. If I'm diagnosed with liver cancer and uh, I decide that I want to give life a try, okay? Even though the odds are against me, I'm going to give it a try. 
what is the doctor going to prescribe for my liver cancer? Chemo. Chemo. That's exactly right. He's going to prescribe chemo. Now, where did chemo come from? Science. <laughs> That's exactly, exactly right. Chemo came from studies that suggested that under certain circumstances, this chemical in chemotherapy will kill the cancer drugs or uh, cells. It'll also kill healthy cells, by the way, which is why you get sick. It'll kill the cancer cells and hopefully it'll kill all of the cancer cells so that the patient will go into remission. That is the hope, all right? Now, if someone was to say, well, given that person uh, chemotherapy is a lost cause. You might as well not even do it because God has already decided that this person's time is up and he's going to die anyway. Um, what would happen to science if people said that? would never advance much further than we we'd never advance that's exactly right we never advance because because the scientists couldn't count on uh, the idea that the medicine that the doctor is prescribing will actually have a positive effect if the, if the doctor thinks that god is going to intervene and decide for himself what's going to happen to this person, whether that person gets chemotherapy or not, then there's no point in even giving it to him because God's going to make the decision. So you see, that's where this, that, that's where this idea that science and religion can exist together came from. Uh, people felt that if, if you're going to rely on faith, then you can't rely on reason because faith will tell you to rely on God and reason will tell you to rely on those things that science has been able to discover. All right. So people see this, you know, this tension between faith and reason, all right? So um, now getting back to deism, there's only one of the founding fathers who was actually a bona fide deist. None of the others were. Do you know who that was? Jefferson. Jefferson, that's yep. right. Thomas Jefferson. He was a deist. Um, how do we know that? Well, we know that, number one, by what he said. And number two, we know that because Jefferson created his own New Testament. And what he did was uh, he, he, he admired Jesus' ethical teachings. So he took the Gospels and he cut out anything that smacked of God intervening in nature. So he cut out all the miracles and he cut out, you know, the story of Jesus walking on water, the story of Jesus calming the storm, the story of Jesus healing the lepers, the story of Jesus healing the blind. He cut all that out. And what you had left was all of Jesus' teachings. You know, love the Lord your God and your neighbors yourself. Um, don't hate, but love your enemies. Uh, pray for those who persecute. He thought Jesus' ethics were the highest ethics that 
anyone had ever uh, thought of. But he did not believe in miracles because he believed that the world operated according to laws that were unbreakable and God did not intervene in those laws. That's why we can count on science to help us solve issues like viral pandemics, cancer, uh, heart disease, or whatever it is, right? However, we as Christians, okay, um, do we as Christians reject science? No. I, I hope you don't. <laughs> because science, I wouldn't be alive now if it wasn't for science, I can tell you that right now. After having gone through uh, four surgeries and facing a fifth, I wouldn't be around if it wasn't for science. Okay, so, um, but here's what I believe about that. I believe, and this is, this is faith. Now, this is not reason, this is faith. And because I believe faith and reason go hand in hand. I believe that, let's take the first surgery I went through. When I was only 19 years old, I came inches from um, so much internal bleeding that I almost didn't make it. All right. And... Um, but I did. And not only that, but the surgeon, when he went in, what he thought he was going to find was a bleeding ulcer. But what he found was something completely different. He found that I had a, an, a, um, a blockage in the flow of blood to my uh, spleen which caused the spleen to, to, um, to expand to three times its normal size. So what he had to do is take out the spleen and he had to reroute the blood so that it's, it, it flows differently in my body than it does in most people's bodies. It's, it's, it just, it's a different flow. Now, I know that that surgery could have gone either way, all right? He was a great surgeon, um, but this was back in 19, this was the winter of 1973. Uh, medicine was not as advanced back then as it is now. And, uh, you know, uh, the night before I even went into the hospital, I could have bled out that night because, because I, I, I had the problem already and they didn't admit me to the hospital until a day later. So if you put all this stuff together, what you get is a combination. You get the skill of the surgeon but you also get the miraculous nature of the fact that I was able to survive what the surgeon considered to be um, a matter of being, he told my mother that your son has a, like a 25% chance of survival. So, so you can have, so I believe God was involved in that because I believe God had a plan for me, just like he has a plan for all of you, okay? 
everybody has a calling in life. Everybody has a purpose and a meaning. And um, purpose and meaning don't come from science. Purpose and meaning comes from faith. All right, so um, when I decided that the purpose of my life was to proclaim and teach the gospel, um, um, I didn't get that from a scientific experiment. I got that from believing from faith that God had called me into that particular um, uh, profession, that that was the purpose of my life. And that if I wanted to live a meaningful, purposeful life that gave me joy in what I did and um, a sense that, uh, you know, life is not just a cosmic accident that, that, that doesn't really mean anything, which is what self-professed atheists believe. Um, that takes faith. Okay, now, so, so what we end up with here is a universe that is indeed... Um, that does indeed operate according to natural laws. We know that because science works. It actually works. But we also have a universe that's not closed. It's not closed because we also know that there is a God who can and who does uh, intervene in people's lives to make sure things go the way they're supposed to go. All right, now I'm going to close this with a story from the Bible that is absolutely, totally clear on what I'm talking about. Okay, and that's the story of Moses. Okay, now Moses uh, Moses didn't know anything about God. Uh, he was raised in uh, by the Egyptian Pharaoh's daughter. And after he killed uh, an Egyptian slave driver, he uh, uh, he fled. Uh, into the wilderness. Uh, he joined the Midianites and he married a Midianite woman who was the daughter of the chieftain. They called them the chieftains. Uh, they didn't have kings. He was the daughter of this chieftain by the name of Jethro. Okay, one day Moses is out tending his sheep. And he thinks the purpose of his life is to be a shepherd. And he's perfectly content with that. You know, it's kind of a nice job. You just sit around, watch these dumb sheep eat the grass. And when they run out of pasture, you shoo them to another place. And then you can sit around and dream about your wife. Okay. So, um, but what happens is Moses encounters a bush that is burning, okay? But according to natural law, that bush should burn itself out and turn into just, you know, uh, ashes. Thank you, ashes. But it doesn't. So he walks over to this bush and God says, Moses, take your shoes off because you are on holy ground. All right. So he does that. And God says, Moses, the purpose of your life is not to be a shepherd. 
The purpose of your life is to free the people of Israel. Okay? Now, Moses doesn't like that idea. He's content with his life as it is. So he comes up with five excuses. This is in Exodus um, chapter 3 and 4. His first excuse is, who am I that I should be leading the Israelites out of Egypt? I'm nobody special. And God says, well, I'm choosing you. So that's just, you know, that's the way it is. So then Moses says, well, I don't know who your name, what your name is. And God says, I am who I am. In other words, you can't limit God. Hebrew names have a meaning to them. And you can't limit God to one name because that limits who God is. So I am who I am means God will reveal himself uh, and enable us to understand who he is in due time. His third excuse is, um, well, what if they don't believe me? And God says, well, you know, he gives them this stick and it'll turn into a snake and, you know, but Moses isn't very impressed with that because magicians can do that. So then he says, um, I'm not eloquent. I can't speak. So God says, all right, I'll give you your brother, Aaron. He can speak. Finally, Moses says, oh, my Lord, please send somebody else. <laughs> and then God got angry and Moses decided, well, I guess I better do this after all. All right. And that's how Moses discovered his purpose in life. All right. Now, um, <clears throat> the world of nature operated according to natural laws back then, just like it does now. The bush kept burning because, because uh, it symbolized God's presence um in the bush uh which is why it, it you know the bush didn't so so god intervened in that specific case normally it would have just burned and then god called moses and that moses accepted the call that was an act of what? Faith. Faith. That's exactly right. Was an act of faith. So in the end, you can believe in science every bit as much as the best scientists in the world, just like Blaise Pascal was. He was a scientist, he was an inventor, uh, he was a mathematician, but he had an encounter with God. It uh, enabled him to come to faith, and he began to see the purpose of his life differently, and it had a meaning and a purpose that only faith can apprehend. All right? So, the universe is governed by natural laws, but it's open to God's intervention. The final intervention of which was the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. Okay, so that'll do it for the chapter on Pascal. Does anybody have any questions or comments before we close it out for today simon for next week any other oh oh i'm sorry yes uh le let me look it up real quick and i'll tell you okay we're going to start getting into the issue of suffering
So we're going to cover chapters 18 and 19. They're, okay. they're, they're short. They're short. So yeah. 18 and 19. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Comment. Yeah. This, this is one of your better ones. This is good. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it, Sharon. Thank you. Uh, it, made, it made more sense than any of the others, so thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I don't always make sense. That's true. <laughs> thank you. Hey, take care, everyone. Hey, we're good. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks.